So good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. And uh, my name is Jean Fajade, and uh, I have really the, the I'm really happy to to share this session on the robotics. And um, with uh, I have no uh, conflict of uh, interest to report. And uh, the session objective today are to learn about the uh, robotic PCI, and uh, we'll look at the, all the step by step from uh, real life experience. Uh, the second objective is to understand. Uh, what are the benefits of the robotic in interventional cardiology. And uh, finally, to uh, uh, look what and dream and what to, will be the future in the next uh, uh, 10 years. And uh, you will see that with the, uh, the arrival on the artificial intelligence combined with the robotic, uh, we, and I, I believe that, uh, our work of interventional cardiology will be totally different of what we are doing uh, today. So this is a slide summarize the agenda of the, the session. Uh, Dr. Bedoni will start by uh, showing a really interesting robotic case. Uh, then we'll be followed by uh, Dr. Gilles from Bordeaux and will uh, uh, give us uh, some uh, you know, uh, data and uh, cases uh, from his experience. Then we talk about the clinical result with uh, Stéphane Rey, and uh, followed by the, uh, Dr. Gaston, uh, who will talk about uh, how should I top robotics uh, in daily practice. And finally, I will try to uh, show you uh, what we could expect from this technology combined with uh, artificial intelligence. So uh, we can. Uh, uh, start by the first presentation with Dr. Francesco uh, Bedoni. Francesco? Oops. Sorry. It's here. Thank you. So, good afternoon. So, we'll present a case, not a so spectacular case, but a typical case that we perform in our cat lab with the, with the robot. Uh, this is my conflict of interest. Uh, this is the patient uh, present clinical presentation in a 71 years old woman uh, with the hypertensive, all the, 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 the risk factor for coronary um, disease. Is uh, admitted in our hospital for uh, uh, acute uh, coronary syndrome with the diagnosis of nonstamia rise of troponin. This is the angio done uh, in, uh, immediately. This is, uh, this is a mild lesion uh, of the LCX, and uh, the left system has a moderate lesion of, uh, of osteal uh, uh, LED, a tight lesion of the middle LED, and uh, a bifurcation lesion on, uh, uh, at uh, the mid circumflex. So uh, we decide immediately to treat uh, the uh, with the robot, robotic procedure uh, the uh, um, left anterior descending artery. Uh, no problem. Uh, we plan the the procedure the, for the treatment of the, the bifurcation lesion of the circumflex next day. Well, and uh, we record this case. So this is recorded. So. The procedure is performed by two very young operators, one a young operator and one, uh, and one fellow. The fellow is inside, the only, only person that is inside the cat lab, protected by the screen, and <clears throat> all the other people outside, she is charging in the robot machine the, the, the J connector, and this is the main path uh, for, uh, for a working path for, uh, for wire and, uh, and, um, and, uh, uh, and balloon, and uh, there is a, a standby path. We started with a, a normal uh, uh, right uh, hydral access. We put immediately two wire because we plan to use two wire and uh, um, to, to stabilize the catheter, but the, 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 there's, uh, we, we didn't touch any way in all, during all the procedure, the guiding catheter. Uh, then we started, we plan 
to, to perform a drag eluded balloon PCI with the FFR uh, monitoring. So we place in the, in the main vessel, in the main circumflex, a FFR wire from the beginning. You know, this is not the same uh, torqueabilities of, the, of the, the common wire. Anyway, you will see on the left, uh, with, the, with the, the right hand, on the right, uh, Mattia Squilacci, the operator, will push uh, the, 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 the wire slowly in advance, uh, you can push uh, quickly the, the, the wire inside the, the cutter, but outside the cutter you, you, you push the wire slowly. We, will, we have some uh, tortuosity there, so uh, Mattia will uh, pull back and uh, advance and he can turn the, the, the wire with, uh, with the joystick, so we can do drilling, you know, it's advancing and, and turning. So there's a very nice uh, tr track of the, of the wire. So we have the FFR wire in place. Alice, this, uh, it's a fellow inside the cat, uh, the cat lab, in front of the, uh, he changed uh, the path, so he, we, we, we put the, the previous wire, the FFR wire, in, uh, in the side uh, path, and I uh, it, it, uh, put uh, in the working part the second wire to, to, uh, to insert the wire in the, in the marginal branch. So, it's ready. That's okay, you know, there's a screen and uh, Mattia is outside and he moved the second wire now. This is uh, quite easy to, to go this uh, a, 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 a Sion Blue uh, wire. It's, uh, it's easy to insert in, uh, to protect uh, the, the secondary vessel. The same problem, tortuosity, it can move uh, very easily at the, in the advance stop and and we pull back because when it's stuck and then it goes drilling uh, moving the 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 the, the joystick uh, and advancing done so now we start with the balloon predilatation with the balloon i told you that we plan to perform a drag eluding balloon pci so but we decide to predilate the lesion with the balloon and with the, the, the left hand, uh, it advanced the balloon of the price precise movement. Uh, we have to, we, uh, just to avoid to, to skip away from, pre, we predilated the 220 semi-compliant balloon inflated to 16 atmosphere. This is the result after the balloon dilatation, seems good. So he retracted the balloon the wire are still in place, so we don't need to do anything. The re -retract, he retract the balloon, he's discussing with me. I'm absolutely relaxed. And uh, now at, uh, we are eating outside, so it's an absolutely relaxing procedure. At, uh, and uh, we plan, we, then we put uh, the, the drag eluding balloon, you know, it's, uh, this is the only one operating in a, in a cat lab, uh, Alice, uh, behind the screen. So we are without any kind of, uh, we inflate the drag eluding balloon. So the only thing that we need to be inside is to inflate the balloon and uh, during, during the procedure because we have not so prolonged uh, <laughs> to, 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 to go outside in the, with the inflator. This is the result after, this is the inflation of a 2.5-26 drag eluding balloon. If you remember, we have the, we have the, the, uh, the FFR inside, so we can measure the result. The FFR is absolutely good. Uh, the, the, the result is 97, but if you check, if you see the, the angle, there is a, there is a, a dissection that we discuss, we can leave or we put a stat with the side at the end to fix the lesion. It's, a, a, it, it's a, 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 an acute patient uh, performed the day before, so we, we put a, a stent in the same working working uh, um, path, you know. Uh, we, have, uh, we, we implant the stent, we have a very precise position on the stent, we put a 2.528 drag eludic stent. stent. <coughs> This is the inflation done by Alice. Now we have the jade wire in the in the marginal branch. Okay, so we decided to 
to, to, to change the wire and measure if you have some uh, split of plaque, if you have, the, if you have the, a, 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 a reduction of flow in, uh, in, uh, in the, this is the, in the, in the secondary branch. And will add very easy to insert uh, through the, the stent struts uh, the FFR. Very controlled movement of the of the FFR, leaving the the other wire in place, jailed. Perfect. We are on top. We can we remove the the, the wire jailed, and uh, we reinsert the other wire in the main vessel. Now we can measure after the. After the placement of the second wire in the main, in the main vessel, we have the FFR now in, a, and we measure the FFR in the side branch. Uh, it's a one, so perfect result. We don't need to do anything, and uh, and then we go again, just to be sure through the stent to measure the final FFR. Beyond the stent, one is absolutely normal, so it's. A, is a perfect result. So at that point, we have uh, uh, angiographic images and uh, functional images in both dead vessels. We finish measuring the FFR in the proximal uh, osteal LED. There's absolutely zero in 98, so normal. So we, we, we finish so the, the, at that point of the procedure. This is the final result you can see and the functional evaluation of both the branches of the CERC and, and the LAD. So the, the, the take home of the case was there was an easy robotic treatment of bifurcation lesion in tortoise vessel with subsequent manipulation of both wires. We had to change only to change in a standby path to the working path of the, the wire. And the procedure was performed by two young operators uh, without additional procedural time outside will case uh, the case is performed by uh, after short learner curve and uh, we have the possibility then uh, in, uh, in the next uh, presentation we will see that in use different tools if you have seen the FF Pharma, you can use uh, IVUS, a guide stock wave wave everything is possible to perform the, be performed with the 0, 0, 014 wire and obviously the main issue is that they have very low x-ray exposure for all the team thank you for your attention uh, Dr. Begoni, you, you want to say yeah. just a brief uh, four or five minutes so we have questions. So first of all, questions in the room you would like to pose? If not, then I can start. Um, practically speaking, what kind of lesions you are looking for at the moment when you offer a, robo a robotic PCI to your patient? Well, sometimes, you know, it has, it, the, the lesion are surprising. In the, in the same the, the same day, we recorded another case with a, it seemed, the, with a little bit calcified lesion of uh, RCA. And uh, it was a, a very long case because it's a calcified. It was impossible to go through with a uh, with balloon. We couldn't uh, relate. We, we, we had to use a, a, a wire extension. We use a shock wave. So sometimes, you know, we plan to perform at this moment quite simple lesion, but I think this is not so simple, the bifurcation lead of the circ. And um, uh, and uh, but sometimes you have some surprise, you know, and so you continue the robotic. Obviously, we can uh, we can do an hybrid procedure. So in, in some uh, situation, you can remove the robot continuous by hand and we'll finish our robotic procedure. So this is a good possibility because we can start with the robotic procedure, but we can uh, uh, we can stop and uh, go through that normal procedure, you know. So I don't stop to motivate you, ask questions. We have stand up microphones, so please use them if you want. In the meantime, um, some of our colleagues like to know whether you can use both radial as well as femoral access with a robot. This is a question for me. Yes, well, we try all, to... all questions are for you. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> at least at the moment. <laughs> no, no, it's okay. Uh, no, we try to do the 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 same procedure that we perform uh, without robots. So I think that an advantage is to use a, 
uh, 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 radial access, six French cutter. I know what uh, we need probably some time more support. So in some cases, it's more, more useful to use the femoral, eight French. Uh, Michael Ode last year showed very fantastic uh, complex cases with eight French. But I think that you can achieve a good support with six French from radial access and with catheter for to do that. Uh, we, we, I will use uh, a normal uh, radial access, you know. Sometimes in this case, I, I know that uh, I have to use two, two wires, so I use the standby wire to stabilize the system and uh, might be helpful, you know. Another practical question. I think there are two ways to manage or manipulate with the wire. The one is you bend the wire, the other is to kink the wire. So these are two different worlds of how to manage it. So you do it in the same way with the robot, like you do it manually, or you experience some kind of change that uh, the robot is taking it a little bit different than uh, when you do it manually. What well, is your experience? I can tell you about my experience from the beginning. As a, in my years, in 1985 years, I, I, I start to... To, to, to curve the wire and I continue with the robot to, to curve the wire and not to, 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 to kink the wire. I prefer, I think it's less uh, aggressive. Uh, honestly speaking, I have the same history, but now a bit difficult, different experience because I kink the wire now with the robot and I find it easier to steer rather than to be bended. But this is an individual thing. Everybody needs to check that for his own and personal experience, how to, to manipulate the wire with the robot down there. So, no other question? I don't see that. John, anything to add from your side? Uh, just a question. Uh, uh, we, we, we saw that the, 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 the circumflex and particularly the OM branch was a really tortuous branch. In this particular case, do you use the same wire as you use for, for a manual PCI? Or do you uh, prefer use uh, an hydrophilic wire? No, uh, we use, uh, no, we don't use, uh, a, the, hydrophilic, the hydrophilic wire is less uh, dangerous in uh, robotic PCI because you control, we don't lose, it's fixed. So this is an advantage to use uh, um, the uh, Teflon coated wire because we don't risk to perforate uh, moving with, uh, with, uh, with wrong uh, movement of the wire. Uh, in this case, this particular case, you use uh, FFR wire. So this, uh, and uh, I find that they have a very, very good feeling to move it uh, with uh, pushing, drilling. Uh, and, uh, Mat Mattia is a great specialist on it. <laughs> okay, okay, thank you, Francesco. And now uh, it's time to move to the second presentation given by uh, Robert uh, Gill. Uh, we show in, uh, show us uh, his experience uh, with from several cases that he has performed in his CAT lab. Uh, Jean, thank you very much for inviting me. I would like to share my experience with a couple of cases, exactly four. The three, uh, first three will be, uh, I would say, is going the last one. I would like to bring your attention to all the, the mo uh, let's say, moments of the procedure because uh, that was, a, in a certain moment, complicated. But we, we uh, found a way out. How can I... Okay, it's, uh... Okay. Sorry. Mm, I have no, I have no a conflict of uh, interest in this uh, particular presentation. So this is a, is a go uh, bifurcation lesion uh, which was uh, predicted to be treated as a provisional according to the provisional T, uh, T stenting uh, uh, access. You see the history of the patient. Nothing special. We try to perform uh, functional assessment during the diagnostic phase, so therefore you see the results showing uh, of the functional assessment, the circumflex artery, that was a significant lesion. So we decided uh, uh, to, to go with a robotic uh, approach. Uh, here you can appreciate that be, um, uh, despite this very, um, very uh, irregular um, uh, uh, let's say um, uh, a lumen of, the, of, of this uh, vessel, it was not uh, difficult to wire both uh, branches. Here you can appreciate 
the results of, of, of IVUS assessment we try and so we succeed in more than 95% of cases to, let's say, IVUS uh, guidance. It led us uh, to, 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 you, to adapt a proper um, additional tools to uh, prepare the lesion and to Im Im improve or optimize the final result. Uh, uh, then, uh, uh, because of the uh, IVUS uh, um, findings, we decided to predilate with a cutting balloon. Here you can appreciate two positions where it was uh, performed. That was Valverin 3 by 6 millimeters, uh, without any problem tracking and, uh, and uh, uh, preparation of, of, the, of the lesion. Here you can appreciate the, the, um, uh, this uh, effect of uh, predilations. And uh, here uh, we started uh, to deliver the stent uh, uh, CryoEvo uh, 3 by 16 and uh, implanted uh, as, uh, across the, um, uh, let's say, it is from circumflex to marginal branch across the uh, distal uh, circumflex um, uh, artery, redilation with 3.5 NC balloons and final, final uh, results. So I can easily say that, uh, that uh, uh, and, uh, and an assessment with, uh, with uh, IVUS showed us that the result was at least uh, uh, very, very, uh, very good. Uh, so for, for this provisional T-stenting, bifurcation lesions, robotic uh, PCI uh, or PCI with uh, robotic assistance is a really very, very nice. You can eat, you can drink, you can discuss, of course, without exaggerations, because you have to be uh, uh, concentrated. Uh, however, uh, it's, it's a big fun. The, the second uh, case is uh, uh, chosen by me because uh, we use for instant stenosis laser wire. Uh, this is also an option, uh, especially uh, this is the best, uh, the best uh, indication for, for, for laser. This, uh, this restenosis was the third one, so that was a really narrow atherosclerosis. And here you can you can appreciate uh, that the lesion was not uh, very very long, however tight. Uh, we were able to perform after a small predilation with uh, <laughs> uh, with 1.75. Uh, the, the passage of IVUS was uh, possible. You can appreciate here uh, these um, uh, 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 tissue characteristics in this uh, uh, instant uh, restenosis. Based on that, we started with laser uh, atherectomy. Uh, we use uh, 40 by 40, uh, the, 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 the setting for, uh, for laser. Uh, if I remember well, four passes and then uh, balloon uh, predilatation, and we finished the, the case, and we finished the case with, uh, with drug uh, coating uh, balloon, Pactitaxel uh, uh, balloon. Here you can, uh, uh, no, that was a serolimus, a magic touch, three by 25, and here you can appreciate the final result. Uh, we were very uh, happy, we, we, we checked it with, um, uh, with IVUS, uh, with a very good uh, uh, result. However, we discovered the problem with with uh, first marginal branch, and using the the wire from from uh, from marginal branch, I was able to uh, let's say to reopen with 1.75 balloon. Also, this side branch, so it was easy. We we uh, the, the usage of a second uh, the, the same wire was was uh, possible. Here you can appreciate a real result with a good flow also in, in first marginal, uh, marginal branch. The case, uh, the case num number three, that was a case uh, uh, in a patient after cabbage. Uh, that was uh, uh, um, a saphenous venous graft, uh, bypass graft to right coronary artery uh, closed, uh, very, almost in the in an anastomosis uh, position. Uh, it was very easy to, 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 to catch this lesion, to deliver the, the wire uh, distally without, uh, believe me, without uh, any, any problem. Uh, I usually use BMW or Scion Blue, these or regular Scion. These three uh, wires uh, are usually used for this uh, situation. Here you can also see the positioning of the, of the, of, of the balloon. 
uh, here um, uh, predilatation, um, 2.5 by, by 15, you see that the result is not uh, um, uh, fantastic. So therefore, we decided to go for stenting free 0 by 16 with 16 atmospheres. And, uh, and uh, you will see uh, the final result uh, uh, confirmed with the uh, IVUS assessment at, at the end. Everything uh, with the usage of, of, of uh, R1 robot from Robocath uh, company. And number four, that was uh, a case um, um, that the patient had, uh, um, this is uh, acute coronary syndrome with ST elevation, however, with a late, uh, a late uh, um, hospitalization, at least, uh, at least one, one day. And uh, the, the, during the, the, after the admission, the, the, the PCI only with balloon was uh, performed for distal LAD. Uh, the, the rest was, uh, was left uh, for uh, eligible uh, patient, eligible um, uh, procedure. However, the patient started to complain and, and two days later we decided to go. And the uh, decision was to use, uh, to use uh, um, uh, uh, robotic support. Here you can appreciate the tortuosity of, of, uh, of um, uh, circumflex uh, artery, also um, uh, LAD, very developed, very, very advanced uh, atherosclerosis. Uh, you can uh, please look at the uh, uh, proximal um, uh, left main, which is uh, heavily diseased in the proximal, proximal part. Uh, I use six French uh, catheter. I decided to go with two wires, uh, just a couple of, uh, of movies showing that the, that the wiring was not uh, very difficult. Uh, you know, in terms of uh, manipulation, advancing the, 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 the wire with, uh, with, with the uh, robot, you know, I feel this textile. It's 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 not that uh, it's something artificial. I, I I really this is not the same as uh, life with with your hands. But still, you see and you feel uh, the, 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 this this and never exceed with the with the with the loops uh, at the and the at the end of of, of wire. So uh, we decided we we succeeded uh, also with this very tortuous uh, LED. I I, I tried to show you that. Uh, it's it's really uh, uh, possible, so we, we we succeeded, and then we started to proceed with the procedure. Uh, we started with, uh, as usually, with uh, IVUS uh, from distal circumflex artery, also uh, assessing the uh, left uh, left main. We sized everything. We knew the the, 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 the the vessel, the real vessel dimension. So therefore, we decided to. So I decided uh, to go with the uh, free zero, uh, not NC, but regular balloon uh, predilation, uh, pre and and then uh, subsequently I decided to go with the. Um, uh, or zero emission 3.5 by uh, 26 to the distal uh, position. And I would like uh, to say you that I found as a very helpful uh, this kind of maneuver that uh, you still uh, try to advance the, the, the wire with this uh, uh, continuous uh, uh, speed. However, you can accelerate the, the wire from time to time, periodically, and it, it, it's kind of uh, pick and, uh, and poke uh, mm, uh, technique, and that, so therefore I was able to, to reach uh, this uh, calcified and uh, fibrotic um, uh, uh, lesions distally without big, uh, big uh, problems. So after first stent implantation, I decided to use another one. Uh, from the, the, the IVUS assessment, the proximal part of, of uh, circumflex artery, the orifice of circumflex artery was, was relatively healthy, so I, I tried to keep it without um, uh, stent uh, uh, implantation. So the next, uh, 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 the next uh, uh, step of the procedure was to, to, to stent uh, 
uh, with 5.0 by uh, uh, 12 um, uh, onyx true star uh, uh, treatment of, of, of a left main. And here you can, uh, you can appreciate the positioning uh, and uh, I, I hope you agree with me that this position looked very promising that that was in the right 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 position and here uh, appreciate the situation of the after uh, left main standing uh, here you see uh, you see the dancing stand in the left main uh, we still kept the the wire uh, in the in the circumflex uh, artery and you see that the stand is undersized this is one mm -hmm. Is, is perlapsed uh, very much to, 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 to aorta, mm -hmm. but we had still the wire in the, in the circumflex artery. And then there was only one decision, the next stent, uh, a little bit uh, smaller in size because of the uh, distal reference. So I decided to go to the, to the beginning of second stent in circumflex, uh, circumflex artery, uh, implantation and redilatation with the pot technique for proximal, for, uh, for proximal part, you can appreciate it here. And here, this is the final uh, result. Look at the next, uh, you see the, 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 the prolapse, the protrusion of the, of the stand into the, into the uh, 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 aorta. And uh, uh, I was able to perform also, also the, the um, IVUS assessment, and then you can, uh, you can appreciate that the distal is well opposed, everything is fine till the, till the, the end of, of uh, 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 left main, but, but you see here the protrusion of the, of the stand. Uh, that was a kind of uh, a complication. Uh, and I'm very, uh, I'm very um, interesting what is your explanation, because my explanation is that there were two or even three small mistakes the one mistake was that I undersized the, 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 the stand because this five was only for distal part of the stand. The proximal was around seven. And in the moment when, uh, when the stand was, uh, was uh, mm, uh, dislocated, why? Probably because of the, of the balloon. I pulled back the balloon too early. There was still some wings because that was five zero. Uh, after, if I remember well, uh, uh, 16 atmospheres, and probably I moved this stand uh, proximally, and uh, the next steps were, were, were difficult to, to redilate maximally because, first of all, I decided to use six French, not bigger, and the second, uh, with uh, this redilation with bigger balloon, I could really uh, lose this stand from, from, uh, from uh, left main. Anyway, this is a set setting in my lab. It's like we, uh, we work with uh, 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 R1 uh, system. Uh, we really enjoy, and uh, our mm, feeling right now is that uh, we are able to perform more than 60, even 70% of cases uh, from the from the uh, technical, anatomical uh, problems. Um, still, um, this is the ideal system where you don't need a second wire and second, second device. So uh, if you need it, you, it's possible to, to do that, but you have changed the path. You have to, to work on, 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 on uh, uh, two, two uh, vessels. Thank you very much for your attention. Robert, great, great cases. A few questions. Um, what do you think about the learning curve? H how many cases you need to perform until you get a good feeling in your stomach that you can do things like you have shown to us? Okay, first statement, I have never played with game boxes. But you never, are old enough never for ever. that. Uh, but after three cases, I started to be very familiar. I started to love it after five cases. So, I, so my feeling is, if you are experienced uh, traditional interventionalist, you need five cases, uh, let's say, to be good. However, might be that somebody uh, very 
experience with this manual tactile will will not uh, feel a, a very um, safely familiar for me that was not a problem after five cases i would say i can do everything okay not not everybody is you but uh, you see it's a reasonable single digit number uh, another question you showed us nice ivos images all done with the 20 megahertz uh, old volcano system so some colleagues might ask you, what's about the new high-definition IVUS? What's about OCT? Can, can we use these technologies uh, also with the robot? Uh, in terms of, 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 uh, of, um, of uh, um, this uh, not, not uh, um, electronic uh, uh, probes, it's, it's feasible. It's, this, is not a, this is not a problem. The problem is with uh, with uh, with um, um, OCT. We have we haven't even we have uh, we haven't uh, tried it. Uh, theoretically, uh, it's possible. However, probably I had so therefore I didn't uh, try it. That there is a problem with the uh, proper uh, uh, adjustive uh, adjustion of, of the size of the of the of the catheter. I, uh, a catheter and, and the rolls in, in, in a, in a uh, arm, working arm. You, do you use the same guiding catheter configuration that you would have used if you would use your manual approach, or do you have slightly different? Uh, no, this ones? is the same. This is the same approach as for, for manual. Okay, and if you need it, can you, the, the robot advance a guide extension? Yes, uh, it's it's feasible. It can be done. You can fix. The additional, um, let's say, uh, uh, catheter within the the guide, and you can use it through the uh, through the uh, procedure. It's, it's 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 feasible. And one final word on the precision. I mean, we have nicely here you in front of us, sitting in front of your monitors. I think the distance between your eyes and the monitors is around a meter or so. When you are with your colleagues in the cath lab, usually it is a longer distance. You have. Or do you experience a difference when you sit there and do the manipulation versus standing at the table looking at even a large monitor in front of you, but it's a slightly fewer away? Michael, uh, until the, I'm in a very bad situation right now because until the last case presented right now, I was sure that this is this much more precise. Let's say I, I am much more precise. I am. Uh, I, I feel very, very. Uh, confident in that, but after this case, I'm not so sure. <laughs> so I made some mistakes. Maybe I was too sure. Uh, that was too easy for me. But uh, the, the the problem is that we have to, we can to be um, uh, um, precise, but you have to take into consideration systolic diastolic movement of the heart. You have to uh, take into consideration the. Uh, 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 sudden exhalation or inhalation of the or, or by let's say given by 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 by, 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 by the patient, so uh, it's very also very imp important to to know the uh, the uh, plaque characteristics and uh, and prepare the, let's say prepare to prepare the the lesion properly, but uh, theoretically and in the majority of cases you feel that you are very very precise much more than manually, because first of all, the monitor, the screen is very close to you, and the second, you can really move the, 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 the balloon or the stand by half a millimeter. But you have to take into consideration systolic diastolic movements. And I think we, we need to emphasize that uh, at the moment, in particular with respect to your last case, the system is not capable to manipulate the guide. So the guide is, is still in the position where yeah. it is, and the only thing you can do is try, if possible, to manipulate wi the, the wire. If you push the wire and hope that you can disengage the guide a little bit, but we know that is creating significant instability. So next gen will for sure help us to manipulate the guide. Robert, I think we covered all your discussion time, or is there somebody in the room? Before moving to the next talk, any question from the, the floor? Do not hesitate, and we have, we have time. Uh, you can take a microphone and uh, ask your question. No question? No question. Okay, everything is clear?
Okay, we can move to the, thank you, Robert. We can uh, move to the next talk. We talk about the late clinical result, and Stefan de Vere uh, will uh, show us some uh, data. Thank you, uh, Jean, and I'd like to thank the um, um, RoboCat uh, for having us here available and for giving the uh, possibility to give this uh, t talk. So I'm going to talk about the latest uh, clinical results. Um, so basically, my talk is going to be split in two uh, talks. One is going to be sharing with you the clinical results, what is out there today, and also uh, a um, sharing of an, a survey that was done by interven two interventional cardiologists and to give you an idea as to how everybody thinks towards uh, the use of robotics in uh, current uh, era. What I'm going to be doing is about this uh, clinical uh, data is, first of all, uh, the R1 robotic system is available in uh, EMA and China. And so, therefore, the studies that have been done is the R1 study so far published, and uh, that's one European study. There is a Chinese study that's not published, and there is a South African registry which is also not published yet. So, uh, altogether, there is um, um, about 251 patients enrolled. It's prospective multicenter single arm report of clinical study, and uh, the indication of the Inclusion uh, uh, were patients with de novo coronary artery stenosis that were candidates for PCI and deemed appropriate for uh, PCI with the R1 system. The follow up is one month, and the primary endpoint is primary, primary safety outcome, absence of intraprocedural complications defined as clinical success, as well as the primary efficacy outcome define as technical success, a successful advancement and retraction of the PCI devices, and a successful treatment of the target lesion without total conversion to manual procedure. And you see that the people uh, involved um, are listed on the slide from Europe, China, and South Africa. So when we look at the population and the angiographic characteristics, it's interesting to see that the uh, Mean age is around uh, early 60s. The predominant population was consistent of male. 80% is about male. And then uh, the rest is actually uh, what we classically see in um, the PCI population. What is interesting is that also a patient with a STEMI has been enrolled into this uh, analysis. In terms of variables, and the question was already raised in the first talk, so the radial axis was 91.3% in all cases. In terms of uh, complexity, I think it's important to mention that about 40% of the lesions treated were uh, complex lesions. And the sheet size was always says six French, and pre-dil was performed in 80, and DS were done in 100%. Post-dilatation was done in almost 70% of the lesions. What about the results? The uh, procedural characteristics in terms of primary endpoints, you see the clinical success was uh, 100% at hospital discharge and well at uh, one month. In terms of uh, technical success, the uh, success rate was extremely high, um, close to 99%, and there's two out of three uh, of the manual conversions were not related to the robot, so basically just one. And I think when you look at the data on the right side, that's what it all comes down to, is the uh, procedure time is um, altogether is 57 minutes with a robotic time of about 22 minutes, the use of contrast media in robotic use is uh, 91 ml. And when you actually compare that to the manual data or previous robotic systems, that is actually very good uh, data. Now, I think, uh, which is important for all of us, all of us doing interventions, um, is the radiation exposure. And I think that one of the reasons why this is all being developed is just because of the reduction in, in radiation exposure. And as you can appreciate, 
you actually have an, uh, more than 90% reduction in radiation exposure for the operator. So I think taking this into account, we can obviously say that robotic PCI is uh, undoubtedly safe and effective, and as we also have seen from the nice case examples uh, presented by the previous two speakers. So, but I think what is interesting now is what it was, so this is an important analysis also for RoboCat, is how is this robotic PCI uh, perceived by the community? And I think, so this is the second part of the talk is, um, so what about, what about the survey? You know, uh, asking the impression of interventional cardiologists, whether they are heavily involved or just have heard of uh, robotic PCI, what do they think of uh, the use of robotic PCI? And so what they say, the number one is radio protection for 47% of the responders. Uh, it's, they mentioned that operating from the uh, control room is being perceived as the most effective radio protection, as you also have seen from the data now. It is still high, the concern for radiation. And as you know, not only radiation, but also the, uh, we all know we all suffer from uh, musculoskeletal disorders and, and have uh, one out of 10 have health related period of absence due to these um, uh, problems mentioned. The number two is the precision, as we also, also have heard in the previous talks, and that's for 43% of the responders. In, indeed, precise and safe wiring, accurate stand positioning, um, and also the uh, locking of permanent devices. So about 66% responders considered robotics bring precision, precision to the procedure. And then number three is the comfort. Uh, I was a little bit... Uh, uh, disappointed that we didn't see the glass of red wine in the previous, uh, we, saw, we saw the sandwich, but I was hoping to see a glass of red wine. Anyway, it's just illustrating how comfortable it is to be doing a procedure uh, from your uh, seat away, actually, uh, from the patient, even though, not to forget, somebody has to be uh, with the patient for safety. So all in all, 87% believe that robotics would improve the quality of the intervention and or consistency of the results. And this survey was also performed in, back in 2019, where we mentioned uh, 61%. So definitely a significant increase. So it's all good to mention, uh, you know, uh, what are the advantages, but I think it's important to uh, give away also some actual limitations. And so what are the actual limitations to global adoption? And when, again, this is data from the survey, and it's interesting to see that the price is uh, an important one, the clinical evidence on the routine use and the clinical application, and the features to be added for mass adoption, as you can see, is the force feedback, the tactile feeling that one can get. Obviously, also the possibility to have two wired tracks and two uh, sidebar tracks, a force device adjustment, and the compatibility with diagnostic uh, devices. And of course, obviously, a list of other ones, like we also, like uh, Michael already uh, pointed out, is the guiding catheter robotization. So 90% um, would consider using a daily, on daily practice of robotic generation able to manipulate a guiding catheter, two guide wires, two stand balloons, and a micro catheter. And 93% if the robot demonstrates ability to treat all kinds of lesions, including CTO. So I think definitely we have made a significant uh, progress. There is still room for improvement, but I think we are, um, you know, people like RoboCat, they're working hard on that. And it's uh, very impressive to see that uh, we have seen a significant amount of progress in the last couple of years. So with that, I'd like to conclude. Thank you for your attention. Stefan, thank you very much. Uh, very interesting information. And the first question from the floor. Yeah, hi, how are you? I'm Ronnie Shantou from uh, Cleveland Clinic in Abu Dhabi. I have a question. Um, you know, one of the number one responses is that it uh, reduces radiation, obviously MSK. Um, this, this is quite helpful. I just wonder, should the comparator be what we're doing today or should the comparator be against these different shield devices that are available where you can actually do the case without needing to wear your lead shield or have to worry about radiation? Because that seems to be the true comparator 
going forward. As of today, I know most of us, probably a lot of us don't have access to that. But if we're talking future, that's one question. Two, a totally separate question. How easy is it to, if there's a complication and you need to switch and you need to let up and move in the room, how easy is it for you to convert and just take control of the device and the equipment and switch to your traditional approach? Yeah, thank you. Very good questions indeed. In terms of the radiation safety or reduction in radiation, I think with the current technology that is out there, uh, I think this survey was made when the comparator were what we are doing today without the use of uh, the current devices. So I think it would be wise to repeat that survey and, and ask what they think, what people think today of using it. Um, like, you know, what is the ramper and all the other kind of devices that are being uh, introduced nowadays. So I think it's a, it's a very fair point. Uh, but still, um, as you could see, you can, you know, be remote from the patient, be relaxed doing the case. And I think this is different from the, uh, the shielding that is, that is being introduced in many other cases today. Um, to your to your uh, second point is what is the conversion? The conversion is actually very easy. It's uh, you can just uh, take it out of the of the of the, of, the, of the box of the toolbox and just <coughs> just do it by yourself. Then, luckily, the conversion rate, as you have seen, is very low. So we're not in a situation that we have tons of experience in doing that, but it's definitely very easy to do so. Stefan, I think you have equipped one of your cath labs with the robot, making it the robotic lab. Now, if you have a patient there being diagnosed and it has a suitable lesion, are you doing an ad hoc robotic PCI or you make it always in an elective staged way? Um, so in our lab, the way it works is that we do most of our cases uh, electively. So that's, that's, that's one thing. But if there is a case where you have unstable angina, nothing prevents us from doing an ad hoc uh, PCI. It's not routine, but it can happen. And we are part also of the uh, ongoing registry, so we try to uh, schedule the PCI electively. So, but both uh, possibilities exist. Another question that is quite frequently asked is, how do you inform your patient when you move into a robotic PCI? And do you need to have a dedicated, informed consent for that kind of procedure from your patient? Uh, it's interesting because, um, so the answer is no. The, uh, because, uh, but still, still the, I want to add, because people know that you're doing robotic, and some of them, they, are you, is the robot going to do that, doctor? And so, and then you actually don't have to ask the question anymore because they're asking it themselves. So, but you don't need a, uh, an informed consent, except when you do a registry or a trial, obviously. Yeah, I think it's a CE marked device. So, I mean, it's not something experimental. Nevertheless, it's, it's, it's reaching an, an amount of, of information that the patient should require. So at least what we are doing is we put that on our regular PCI consent form that we're going to attempt it via a robotic approach. Yeah. Stefan, thank you so much. Pleasure. Thank Covered you. all the questions. And John, then we continue. Yeah. And now we invite uh, Dr. Uh, Richard Gaston, and uh, we will talk about why is uh, adopting robotic uh, PCI in daily practice. Well, thank you so much for your kind invitation. Uh, I am a urologist. And uh, I had the opportunity uh, 25 years ago to develop a radical prostatectomy by, by LIP. We were the first in, in the world to do that. And uh, it was, uh, for me, easy to move from LAP uh, to Robo. And we began robotic surgery at the beginning of the 2000. And uh, we had uh, 23 years of experience of robot in, in surgery. and. Uh, I can give you some message about the, the evolution of robotic surgery in urology, especially. So, I have no conflict. So, we uh, begin uh, by a short history of the, the robot in, uh, in urology and general surgery. We begin by a very simple robot with uh, three arms in uh, 99, and uh, we move uh, very quickly. Uh, to a second uh, generation with four arms. 
and uh, uh, HD uh, vision. So it was uh, clear that the operating field was much, much uh, better and uh, it was easier after uh, five or ten procedures to see that we have a much better operating field than in conventional laparoscopy and the mobility of the instrument was much better than the human hand. So the third uh, generation, uh, we had uh, some uh, more device like uh, fluorescence and uh, uh, the evolution of the HD uh, vision. So the last generation of uh, SI was really the beginning of the development of robotic surgery, uh, especially in neurology. And uh, it was uh, in uh, 2009, we have a robo much simpler, more compact. It was easier to introduce the robo in uh, operating room without uh, any, any problem. And uh, we were doing more and more and more uh, procedure, uh, really at the, around 2009-2010, we moved completely from open to robo for every procedure, even cystectomy and uh, neobladder. In our institution, we stop open uh, way at that time, moving completely uh, to robotic procedure. So the last evolution is the XI. Uh, what is interesting in the system XI, there is no conflict between the four arms. So it was easy and it's easy today uh, to make a partial nephrectomy. And I can say that the, the victory, one of the victory of the robot is to, to come from nephrectomy to partial nephrectomy. And now today when we have a, a tumor of the kidney, uh, to the help, with the help of the robot, we are able to remove just the tumor in 95% of the case. The, the last generation is the, uh, the new uh, system of Da Vinci. We have today the, the feedback. It's a new generation, but really it was not necessary to, to feel anything because the quality of the vision was absolutely uh, so nice that the feedback was not necessary. So before beginning robotics, we have a lot of questions, like everybody. So what was really the benefit of the patient? Uh, is it safe? It's more precise than the open way? It was not longer time than manually? <coughs> what was the real cost? What was the learning curve? What were the, the, the additional physician needs in the operating room? And uh, uh, it was really possible to do completely the procedure robotically. And today, after 20 years of experience, we have the response to this question, of course. Uh, and uh, at the end, the physician can be replaced? No. Today, the physician is much better than before. So what we can say objectively, uh, when we remove a prostate, for example, we have less blood lost, less pain, less recovery time. So it's safe. So I, I think today that we have less, less complications than, than before. The stability, three division, of course. And about the, the time of the procedure, this morning, this morning, I removed a prostate in 22 minutes, 10 years ago, uh, in uh, other centers by open ways, they need one hour and a half, two hours. So today we can say that the time is reduced by using a robo. What is the cost? Of course, the cost is higher, but the patient you treat today will give the hospital tomorrow morning. So the hospital stays much, much shorter with the, with the robo. The learning curve, I have the experience to see young surgeon able to do a very difficult procedure much easily. I think the education of surgery today is easier than before uh, when we were opening the patients. Uh, 
what we need, one surgeon, one assistant, is not necessary to have, we have just four instruments. For the assistant, we have a suction device and, gra and a grasper and uh, some uh, staples, nothing else. So the number of instruments had reduced uh, alone. And of course, of course, we perform the procedure completely robotically. It's not necessary to use hybrid procedure. When we have some adhesions before uh, putting the, the arm of the robot, we remove the adhesions uh, laparoscopically. So I think it's really a progress. There is no discussion. Today, the open way in our specialty is died. And the present and the future is uh, robotically, uh, of course. And uh, uh, I, I can say that the physician today is much better than before because we have a much, much better knowledge of the microanatomy of the prostate, the kidney, and the bladder, of course. So uh, what we can, can say, uh, robotic gave a lot of benefit uh, to the, the surgeon. Uh, we, we have uh, four arms, instrument with higher direction to, to work, and uh, of course uh, it's less invasive for the patient, uh, less pain, less bloodless, and uh, of course the, the physician, the comfort for the physician is higher. We can perform uh, with a single, conf single console and two robots, we can perform seven or eight radical prostatectomy uh, per day. So the cost, of course, it's probably a problem, but if we look at the short hospital stay, it will be uh, reduced. Thank you so much for your attention. Dr. Gaston, thank you very much because you opened our eyes uh, how surgery managed it to get the robots integrated into their daily life. Can you tell us, I mean, you, you have these, these experience in advance of us. What, what was the major reason why robotics became so attractive to surgeons? Nowadays, I mean, you showed I, us I think, the, the, I, I the think, surgeon is not working without no, any no, longer. No, no, I, I think what it was for it, I think it's evident because you have a fantastic vision. It's fantastic vision and uh, the, the mobility of the instrument. We have, we have instrument with, with eight axles, axes of mobility. And for example, when you use a scissor, you are able to cut from above to, to you. And uh, uh, I, I think it's, uh, it's uh, so, so clear. So the operating field is so, the gas is helping you. The gas is the first assistant of the, uh, the uh, robotic surgeon in our specialty. And uh, the operating field is always very clean. And uh, uh, open way will disappear. We never had the scientifically the proof that the open way was worse than robo. But today, open way is completely died. It's evident. It's a level of evidence number one. OK. The question is, um, there is one major contributor in the field of robotic surgery you showed it us yeah um they have quite a history and they have a, a multi-billion dollar impact into the evolution of that technology question nowadays is you think we can replicate something in cardiology i think the next uh, the, the the next step is probably the tele tele surgery is the next step is the next step Uh, we can add we can add virtual pictures in our screen. For for example, for kidney tumors, when you are dissecting uh, the kidney, if you don't see perfectly the tumor, you can introduce in the robot the virtual picture to see where is the tumor, where are the artery, the vein, the urinary tract. And so it's easier and easier and easier, and the learning curve. I think it's one of the most important message. The learning curve is much, much, much shorter. So I think you pushed us 
to continue in this way. Absolutely. I, I, I'm, I'm very grateful for this uh, because absolutely. You still, in, in our community, you, there are a lot of people who are saying, well, I can do best with my hands and my brain and no computer will beat me at any time. Yeah, you know, we, we had to fight. I begin, I begin lap in 1991, 92. We have 10... 15 years of fighting against open surgeon, but today they don't speak and they will disappear. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. And now, now it's my great pleasure to ask Jean to give the last lecture of that session with his personal perspective. Where are we with robotics in PCI in 10 years from now? Jean. So I have no uh, conflict uh, of interest. So uh, what I would tell you is not uh, experience. Huh? We are talking about the next 10 years. So we have experience from the surgeon, and uh, uh, they explain how it was difficult with the surgical environment many years ago, and now the policy has totally changed. So, The question is, do we see the same evolution in PCI that the, the surgeon saw in the last uh, uh, 10 or 15 years? So what we can see today is that robotic PCI is feasible. You saw that uh, <coughs> the several uh, cases, very nice cases. It's safe and there is absolutely no increased risk for the patient. We know that. Uh, there is a large experience with single vessel and single lesion angioplasty. But in the same time, we can say that we could treat multi patients with uh, multiple, multi vessel disease or multiple lesions. When you look at the uh, complexity of the uh, lesion treated by robotique, complex lesion, in other words, long lesion. Uh, bifurcation lesion and osteo lesion can be safely treated. What I will say is certainly the most interest of robotic is for osteo lesion. Could be osteo RCA, osteo left main, or osteo side branch within a bifurcation. Comparison to manual PCI, at present time, It could be a little bit longer than the a manual uh, a procedure, uh, not because it's the way to uh, the time to treat the patient, but it's a way to uh, prepare the robotic uh, 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 around the patient before starting the procedure. Second, uh, in some complex lesion, you could have a higher contrast volume and a longer fluoroscopy time. So. What you could say, it, this is definitely reduced by the, the experience. Um, sorry. So what we have learned is that, that the robotic benefits are the precision in the wire navigation. And we saw uh, uh, one of the first cases with this, uh, you know, very tortuous uh, circumflex marginal artery. You saw really the navigation of the wire with extremely precision. Uh, the stand positioning, again, it's like the, the osteo lesion, the stand positioning is really millimeter by millimeter. And you have time to uh, advance re or, or uh, remove the stand. Full radio protection, uh, and it's true that uh, this is an important advantage for the, the operator. In other words, you could work sitting on the chair outside of the guiding without any uh, uh, X-ray exposure. And it's true that there will be uh, certainly in the future a reduction of uh, orthopedic injuries. Uh, of course, we need a uh, training for, uh, like for all the new procedure. Importance of the communication between operator, between the cat lab and the control room. 
and uh, uh, we need a technical improvement for smoother use in a complex lesion. Uh, we can today uh, reuse parallel wire, we saw uh, during the cases, uh, balloon and stand for bifurcation, uh, the treatment of bifurcated lesion. Uh, over the wide device uh, compatibility, we have uh, discussed with some devices. And uh, again, the full CatLab integration, but this is, uh, you know, uh, it's uh, facilitated by the number of, uh, of cases that uh, you are uh, doing. So, uh, what we could say, sorry for the, when I click it, I, uh, sorry, I cannot uh, advance. So these uh, are the, the, the current situation in 2024. What could be the future? Certainly the future will be combined in the next 10 years with the arrival of artificial intelligence in interventional cardiology. And I fully, uh, I'm, fully, I'm fully convinced by the, the fact to get this artificial intelligence in our environment in the CAT lab we change totally our way of working. We change our way of uh, diagnostic, our way of uh, decision of treatment for the patient, integrating all the clinical, uh, the clinical characteristic of the patient and geographic characteristic of the patient, biology characteristic of the patient, etc. And the artificial intelligence we uh, give you <coughs> very uh, quickly and, and fast. Uh, the, the best way to treat uh, the patient. So, uh, artificial intelligence uh, uh, is an umbrella term for a set of uh, uh, multiple algorithms that imitate intelligent human behavior, but there are certainly uh, will be more efficient than uh, our uh, brain. Uh, the application of uh, artificial intelligence in interventional cardiology, in fact, will be divided in two uh, main branches. First, the virtual, and I talk to you about uh, the machine learning, deep learning, and the connective computing uh, to control health uh, management system. And the second will be the physical branch uh, be represented by the robotic uh, procedure. Sorry again. So the future will be uh, based on the potential application of artificial intervention in intervention cardiology concerning image, video analysis, clinical decision support, novel approach to clinical uh, data by database analysis, uh, augmented reality platform, voice power of, uh, virtual assistant, and robotic assistant with a procedure. And artificial intelligence in interventional cardiology. Uh, today, it's the current, it's an early stage, but there will be a, a rapid uh, evolution. And uh, I am pretty sure that uh, this will transform our way of working. So what could be the future catheterization laboratory with artificial intelligence enabled technology? This could be uh, a schema of uh, the, the CAT lab in the future. And you could see that uh, first, uh, <coughs> the, uh, the operator will be sitting in front of uh, uh, a large uh, screen. Second, uh, there will be the clinical decision support system. According to this, we will be collect all electronic uh, uh, data, medical support, etc. what I tell you. And at the end, the machine will give you the best, uh, way, best indication of treatment, the best way to treat it. Uh, then the, they will be uh, connected with a semi-autonomous vascular robotic system uh, with you, we will see improvement of the technique uh, year after year. And what will be interesting, that we will work in front of uh, an augmented reality system, which will be totally different of what we have in front of our eyes uh, today. 
So the integration of the CAT Lab uh, over the coming years, we go to the fourth generation that we saw uh, the, during the previous uh, presentation. So for the Da Vinci, we, were, we are there. They are moving to the fifth and the sixth generation. For the robotic PCI, we had at today at the second uh, equivalent of the second generation. So we expect that in the next uh, coming years, there will be <coughs> better connection between the card lab and the operating theater concerning imaging and the table. And for the fourth generation, with the total integration of the environment based on uh, artificial intelligence. So this is coming from uh, a questionnaire uh, and uh, answer by the, the cardiologists, and you could see that uh, that uh, close 70 percent consider that robotics open new possibilities in the term of treatment approach and device selection. Uh, 87 percent consider integration with the imaging system, which will be crucial. More than 80 percent would adopt robotic if uh, it was able to treat any kind of lesion. Question who could be uh, uh, the, the CTO. Of course, it depends on the anatomy and the indication. And uh, close to uh, 80% of the, the people consider that uh, 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 using robotic you, you be a potential solution. So uh, today we are here. In other words, we are performing procedure uh, with a uh, lesion characteristic assessment based on uh, invasive or non-invasive tools, invasive FFR, QFR, IVUS or CT, and uh, uh, the lesion wiring uh, today, the robotic navigation can do it. Concerning the lesion dietation or the lesion stenting, the robotic today can uh, do it. And again, with extremely precision millimeter by millimeter, particularly for osteolation. Concerning so the correct uh, positioning and uh, deploying today, uh, we are based on these uh, uh, invasive uh, uh, tools. And uh, today, the procedure location, uh, we, could, we, can prefer, we can perform the procedure from the control room not inside the cat lab, but outside the cat lab, and uh, which is uh, really, really better for the comfort of the operator. How can tomorrow, we can expect tomorrow, uh, the use of robotic? Certainly from the lesion characteristic assessment. Uh, thanks to the artificial intelligence, we will have a totally different view of the vessel, the lesion, the possibility to have a 3D uh, imaging. Concerning the wiring, it should be certainly totally automated. In other words, the machine, we will print certainly the point at the ostium of the vessel, the lesion, the distality of the vessel, and the wire will follow the line without absolutely no, uh, no um, manual uh, per performance from the operator on the robotic. Concerning the lesion treatment, it could be balloon, it could be stank, it maybe it could be another technology in 10 years. This should be certainly totally automatic. And uh, positioning, of course, of the, uh, the, the device to be the same. And we talk about that concerning the procedure location, certainly we could perform a procedure not in the control room, not in the same hospital, but it could be certainly in the, another, uh, uh, another hospital. So uh, what I will say, it's, it's just a dream. Eh? We are dreaming. But when you discuss with the people working in the technology of uh, airplane and uh, all, on this environment. They are ready for this evolution. In other words, here you could see the cockpit of an actual Airbus uh, A320. 
And uh, today, the pilot is, the, is uh, dri driving, piloting the airplane with you know, the help of all the computer system. And so we need one or sometimes two uh, co-pilots to pilot this uh, Airbus A23 or the other type of uh, Airbus. I'm not talking about Boeing, only Airbus, because I'm from Toulouse, and we have Airbus industry in Toulouse. So the future of the cockpit could be this. In other words, the, the pilot will have this kind of uh, big screen in front of him, and the takeoff, the landing, uh, all the trip between the two cities will be totally automatic. In other words, the pilot will be in the cockpit just in case of. But everything will be automatic. This is uh, not a dream. This is what? This is coming from Thales. They are working on that for the next generation of plane. So what we could believe is that we could have the same evolution. This is the image of the CAT lab today. We can do perform robotic procedure in the control room. But in the future, we could work, we can imagine and dream to work in, in front of a big screen, like exactly like the, the, the screen in the, in the airplane in the next 10 years. And the operator should be there just to control in case of. And the machine will perform all the procedure, and again, the operator will be there to, in case of a complication, something like that. So this will be uh, certainly the, the future. It's a little bit, uh, we are a little bit dreaming when we are looking at that, but uh, this should be certainly the future in the next uh, uh, 10 years. So should we, this will be based of, uh, of course, this uh, intelligent surface, the 3D imaging with augmented image will, be, will play a major role. Uh, there will be a multi cat lab uh, measurement. And again, everything will be, all this progress will be uh, achieved thanks to the artificial uh, intelligence. Thank you very much. Jean, for the, for the sake of time before you wrap up the session, one question, with this perspective for the next 10 years, is the interventional cardiologist a dying animal? Means, is, is the interventional cardiologist, as he or she is working today, no longer existing in 10 years? Personally, yes, I'm sure. I'm 71, so in 10 years you'll be 81. So, so, so you, don't, you, don't, you don't take care. <laughs> so certainly I will uh, stop my work. No, I think we will need uh, in the future, uh, of course, interventional cardiologists. The problem is, will be the training. There will be a problem of training. In other words, we will have technically, we could do that, but the problem will be the training how to train, when we will be a young, uh, young cardiologist, how to uh, start to train, uh, uh, is, if it will be possible in the different, uh, you know, in all the different uh, university hospital. I'm not sure. Uh, again, when you look at the training of the pilot, there are special center for training, but uh, it's quite limited. So I could not say that the training center for international cardiology will be, will be limited, uh, but certainly we will have some specific large center equipped this, uh, with this technology, and the people will come from all the hospital to uh, take a sort of fellowship of six months, one year, uh, in order to uh, practice and train with this uh, new technology. Okay, thank you. So, why don't you wrap up the session? So, we can uh, wrap Briefly. up uh, the session, but uh, we can do uh, uh, without a slide, if, uh, the slide. So, what we could say, it's first, at present time, robotic PCI is effective. It's safe, we saw all this data, and this could be applied or 
simple or complex lesion like bifurcation and uh, uh, the most interest is osteo lesion for me. And concerning the devices we could use today, uh, this kind of device, FFR, IVUS, and uh, IVL. The benefit we saw during this session, the benefit for the patient is the precision of the navigation and the precision of stand positioning. And this is uh, for the patient a good, very good point. For the CAT lab team is a full radio protection. We saw the uh, for 90% to a close to zero. And the reduction of orthopedic injuries, which is not uh, a small uh, problem. Uh, for uh, there are more and more today interventional old interventional cardiologists who have uh, some uh, back problem. Uh, interest in robotic uh, in interventional cardiology uh, will be growing with uh, technical improvement. And again, remember this uh, uh, slide comparing the surgery they have at the stage four, five, six, and we are today in PCI at the stage two. But there will, there will be this kind of uh, improvement. And finally, uh, the future integration of robotic will be accelerated with artificial intelligence and vice versa. And this will be certainly the future of interventional cardiology. Thank you.